a space where beauty meets authenticity and transformation is not just a possibility, but a promise. I'm absolutely thrilled to introduce you to someone truly special, Dr. Rukmini Vinaya Rednam, the compassionate force behind the countless remarkable transformations in the vibrant city of Houston, Texas. Picture this, every curve, every contour crafted with care and expertise, not just by a board certified plastic surgeon, but your very own cheerleader for self-discovery and confidence. Get ready to embark on a journey where we explore the art of science of feeling your very best self. This isn't just a podcast. It's your cozy corner of empowerment and inspiration. So pull up a chair, pour yourself a cup of kindness, and let's dive into the Confidence Doc podcast with Dr. Rukmini Vinaya Rednam. Welcome back to the Confidence Doc Podcast. I'm Dr. Rednam. I'm a board certified plastic surgeon with my Houston Surgeons, and we are located in the Houston area. Um, today, I have a local, well, actually, I should say a social media celebrity, <laughs> um, Dr. <laughs> Dr. Kelly Colleen um, on our podcast. She's also a board certified plastic surgeon who practices in the Beverly Hills area. So welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. So um, tell our listeners a little bit about yourself. How did you find yourself in plastic surgery? So I grew up in a medical household. Both of my parents are surgeons, and I, I definitely have that surgeon personality. So I, I bounced around a little bit in school, but I eventually settled on going to medical school, and I always knew I wanted to do surgery once I got there because it's just the coolest specialty ever. And um, plastic surgery always spoke to me because – it's really the only surgical specialty where there isn't an algorithm for everything. There's a lot of nuance to how you treat problems and there's differences in how different people approach problems. And I love that. It just felt more thoughtful to me. And I really enjoy how you operate all over the body. Um, and that's not common with surgery anymore. And, you know, plastic surgeons, you find us in the scalp and you find us on the feet. And we are all over the place. And I think that really makes it fun and exciting as well. So those are really the things that spoke to me the most about the specialty because it's, of course, the best. Uh, what type of surgeons are your parents? So my dad is a vascular surgeon and my mom is an ophthalmologist. Both of them are retired now. They retired a couple of years ago. So, yeah, I also come from a big medical family. And so it's, oh. it's like you 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 come from that point where you're like, I don't my my dad was an ophthalmologist. Oh. And um, we were kind of like, oh, I don't know if I'm going to do this, not. But then you get so much exposure and it's it's like you, you just fall in love with it sometimes. And so it was the same thing where I was like, OK, I think I want I think this is where I belong. And then I was like, surgery has to be it. I yeah. knew surgery was going to be it. Oh, for sure. The surgery personality is like a real thing. I looking back on medical school, I'm sure you had the same experience you know who the surgeons are like day one. Like there's just a, a very definitive surgical personality. And I think part of why so many doctors, kids do medicine is we, we hear about it all the time. You know, our parents don't go home and end their job. Their jobs can be <laughs> on the weekends and at night and you hear about it. And I think it's so rewarding to care for people and help them through problems. And I think that really was translated and how they discuss their jobs. And it made me want to do it. And, you know, I can say, like, I love following you on social media. You are such a good educator. You know, you make it, you keep it interesting too, right? Like you got a good sense of humor and, <laughs> and you're not afraid to throw a few punches. Right. Um, but, you know, one of the things that recently you talked a lot about was um, the difference between cosmetic surgeons and plastic surgeons. And I, I know doctors who still do not understand that difference. So can you explain to our listeners a little, like what, what is the basics? What is the difference? Don't we all do cosmetic surgery? Right. And I, I think you, you really hit the nail on the head. People in the medical community have no idea. I mean, there is a massive um, nurse influencer on TikTok who I adore, who had her procedures done by a cosmetic surgeon. And she is a huge advocate of making sure you know who's taking care of you. Don't take advice from people who aren't qualified. And she was clearly didn't know, right? I mean, she went to a cosmetic surgeon. So I think when you look at medical training, the, the, the situation is, is that there are 
residencies after your training that are all run by the same group. So there Mm -hmm. is like a a governing body in the United States that runs all of the residencies. And this is the ACGME. And there is one and only specialty that trains in cosmetic surgery, and that is plastic surgery. And um, there's two paths to plastic surgery. As many people may know, you can either do complete a surgical residency first and then do a short plastic surgery training program. And this is the more traditional method. This is what I did. Mm -hmm. And then there's the newer method, which is really taking over for a lot of the subspecialties is um, you do just a few kind of prerequisite years in general surgery and then do more years in plastic surgery. And this is the, you know, accepted, regulated way to learn cosmetic surgery. It is a part of our training in plastic surgery. Now, there are people who are interested in doing cosmetic surgery because it's lucrative. It's the, really the only area in medicine where patients are paying out of pocket for procedures. And they want to get a little bit of that sweet, sweet cash, and they don't want to do the proper training. And so they were doing this on their own. And obviously, this is not really an acceptable way to do anything in medicine. You're doing things that are potentially dangerous and can harm people. And they have created their own alternate board. So after you finish your training in ACGME residency, you sit for a board, an American Board of Medical Specialties recognized board, which plastic surgery is. So they created their own training program and their own board. It's only one year. It's not structured. It's not governed by the same body that governs your oncologist, your pediatrician, and your OB and your plastic surgeon. And they have their own board. That's not part of the American Board of Medical Specialties. And the reasoning for this was not to create well-trained cosmetic surgeons. Their goal was not to create a fabulous doctor that does tummy tucks. The goal was to sound like they could compete with us. And, uh-huh. and I think a lot of people don't understand that. And luckily, many of the states didn't fall for it. And they don't allow those people to advertise that they are board certified because it's not an accepted board. But some states do. And this is where it gets confusing for patients. And um, the other thing people don't realize is that hospitals don't fall for it. So you can't typically get hospital privileges to do those procedures, which are cosmetic procedures, unless you do a plastic surgery training program and have a plastic surgery board. So if you're going to choose one of those doctors who didn't do all of the recognized accepted training paths and boards, you're really setting yourself up to be cared for someone that doesn't have the ability to really well care for you because they don't have the proper training. And they also don't have the ability to go to a hospital and care for you, even if heaven forbid something goes wrong, but you had your surgery done as an outpatient. And, you know, it's, it's I think that some people say, oh, we're trying to gatekeep, right? Like we're, we don't want others. In. And that's not the case at all. We, If you want to be a plastic surgeon, be a plastic surgeon, go through the training. Right. Um, and it's because... Yes, I can even say it. I'm sure you said I've seen results of some people who are cosmetic surgeons and been like, oh, that's a good result. But the thing is, though, is when everything's going great, it's wonderful. But when things everything blows up and you're not doing well and you're sick, you want the person that's done all that other training that we've done that knows when, you know, shit hits the fan, like what's going to happen. And um, and. They don't know that. They just don't know that. And they're, at least not with consistency because they can be any number of specialties before they do this one-year fellowship. Right. And their their advertising and even their websites are very misleading for these cosmetic surgery groups. Like they'll say that you have to have a surgery residency as a prerequisite. You and I both know many cosmetic surgeons who are board certified and on their site who have not even completed any residency. Um, mm-hmm. It might be a non-surgical specialty like dermatology or you know, potentially family medicine. There was one here in Los Angeles that made the national news that was a pediatrician. Um, you know, it's it's just the consistency is not there. And the one that went viral that was this person was calling themselves a plastic surgeon but never did the plastics training. She did a one-year cosmetic surgery fellowship. And it was one guy who was an ENT who wasn't a plastic surgeon either, teaching her to do body cosmetic surgery. So the standard of education and training is just not up to snuff. And they actually sued in California several years ago and tried to get the right to call themselves board certified. And the medical board reviewed all the records and everything of what their training entails. and was like, no, sorry. That's yeah. Great. Yeah. You know, fail. You, you don't get to do that. 
Um, and you know, I don't really care if people think I'm gatekeeping class. I'm gatekeeping plastic surgery. I, I think that you shouldn't. I, I think oncologists should gatekeep being an oncologist. Mm-hmm. Really, that pediatrician should gatekeep being a pediatrician. This is a patient safety issue. You know, I I want people to get safe surgery and feel good. And the reality of medicine is that it's not risk free. Even in the best of hands, you're going to have complications. And like you said. Who do you want standing over your bed if you have yeah. your problem? You want a pediatrician who's never steps in a regular operating room or a surgical ICU, or you want me and you who are board certified general surgeons and plastic surgeons who can handle pretty much anything because problems happen. And it's it's very mis- it's interesting because you know we try to educate as uh, plastic surgeons about the differences, but the American Board of Cosmetic Surgery goes beyond that to the point where they 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 try they they really put out a ton of misinformation where they say they're not only are they trained to do things they're better trained to do it than we are right you know they 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 have this whole diagram on their website of how we're a little pie chart yeah, we're reconstructive surgeons, right. um, and that and we don't receive any cosmetic training. But the truth is, if you can rebuild it, you you are a cosmetic surgeon. Right. Because you how can you rebuild a, something? A wall recon, you can do a tummy tuck, and yeah, <laughs> you know, it, it's just so silly. And and they're also they don't like we we've really come from behind because there's less of us, and we also hold ourselves to this ethical standard with what we say. Mm-hmm. And they don't have the same standards. They can say whatever the hell they want, and they're allowed to, whereas we, we don't. So we've really not been vocal in the past countering the information. And, and unfortunately, it's allowed them to go wild. And I'm glad that, you know, people like you and others are speaking up now because it's it's up. We're the only ones that can really um, help educate people on this, because like you said, it's just been something that's been by the wayside. When I've explained this to other doctors and they're like, how is that even legal? How is it legal? And I'm like, because it's just been allowed to continue. Like no one's ever been like, no, stop. Don't do this. Right. Um, you yeah. know, and it, it's it's really sad. And um, like you said, like people who are well trained in in, in medicine will still go to a cosmetic surgeon and have zero idea and it is because they, they sometimes they won't even put what their board cert they'll say i'm board certified it's just board and what it's just oh, i'm board certified that's yeah. it yeah and patients don't understand the board process they, they just don't understand it, nor, nor should they it's not part of their world and i think in a perfect world all doctors would behave ethically and they would do everything right and explain things well but that but again when money gets involved people make very bad decisions and their ethics go out of the window sometimes, and they're very willing to say and do things to purposefully mislead patients, and it's it's very unfortunate. So any information you and I can get out there is always helpful because then that helps people be empowered to make safe, good decisions for their bodies. And I think you you hit it on the nail right there is that like at the end of the day, do you want somebody who's chosen what we is really kind of an unethical pathway to get to what they want um, trading you? And I don't think I would. So I wouldn't either. And I'm just going to be like a bitch right now and say that that (laughs) most of them would have never got into plastics. Plastics is one of the most competitive specialties in medicine. And, you know, the people that I personally know that I trained with that ended up going to cosmetic surgery were people who could have never done this route. So, you know, and that's, that's the reality. People that can do the right stuff. I, you know, I can still remember my chairman um, having a local OB who wanted to just like observe some cases. He said, sure. And then afterwards she's like, well, um, you know, if you could let me come for a few weeks and really teach me how to do tummy tucks, that would be great. And he was like, well, sure. He's like, we have a program here. You can apply and we'd be happy to see, it, you know, if you make, have a spot in our intern class. And she was so offended. But it's like, you know, like I said, this is a craft and there's a lot of things that have gone into it, w- us getting here. And uh, right. it's not something that I can teach you in a weekend course um, or that uh, you can reliably and safely learn how to do. Absolutely. I mean, it's, it's a technical skill, but it takes many, many years to learn how to properly assess a patient and how to properly assess a patient with problems. So kind of in the same line, something else that's out there that a lot of people talk about on social media is uh, medical tourism out of the country. And I think that we've all seen the effects of that. What are your thoughts on if someone, a friend were to come to you and say, hey, I really want to go out of the country to a plastic surgeon. What's your opinion on that? I mean, you know, here's always my problem with this. So I trained in Los Angeles. I'm a Southern California native. 
we spent a lot of time taking care of patients who had procedures in Tijuana in particular and would show up in our emergency rooms with horrible problems. And it's there, there's a few problems with medical tourism. So the, the big chunk of people who are going out of country to have surgery are not doing it because they're seeing the best and brightest doctors in the Dominican, in Mexico, in Turkey, right? They're doing it because it's very cheap. There are seeing mm-hmm. people that are very, very inexpensive, and that's why they're going. And, and a lot of times they try to convince themselves that this is the best place in the world to have surgery, Tijuana. But that, that's not the reality. And there's wonderful doctors all over the world, but they're not bargain basement. And um, that you need to be able to grapple with that truth if you're considering this. So that, that's problem number one. Problem number two is always, how do you assess someone? It's hard enough for people in the United States who, who kind of, if you know the language, to figure out how to vet your team. How do you mm-hmm. figure out, like when your patients see you, they can go to certification matters and they can find out if you're board certified. They can verify you have hospital privileges, but you don't really know how systems work in Mexico, Dominican, Turkey, you know, wherever you decide to go. And you are, you have to trust someone unless you're from there and have family and know how to navigate it. You're trusting someone. And they often trust these medical tourism agencies Mm -hmm. that are financially benefiting off of them going. So you're trusting someone who has a vested interest in you going. That's not a good person to trust. And, and people think that the surgery is done when the surgery is done. So, so much of how someone heals is the post-op care over the first six months after surgery. And you're not going to have that in a Zoom call here or there is not, it's not going to help you. And yeah, what we see is that people do okay, they go home, and then they have problems. And finding someone to care for you when you have problems is very difficult. You, you First of all, many of these patients, because they went somewhere very inexpensive, cannot financially afford to come see someone in the States. They've kind of spent their savings on their trip and they don't have the funds. And this is a cash pay thing. You're going to be paying out of pocket and finding someone alone is hard. And then if you end up going to the ER, you end up spaying, paying the absorbent hospital costs for an uh-huh. emergency procedure and care. And there is a premium on having emergency care. You know, if you see me in the hospital for an emergency consult, it's much more expensive than if you see me in my office during business hours. So, you know, people end up being financially devastated by this. Um, I'll just be frank. The results are often subpar that I end up seeing and they can't get help. And I, I don't know if you have this experience, but on TikTok in particular, I have comments and DMs daily from people who had surgery out of the country who are struggling and need help. And it's heartbreaking because obviously I can't help people on social media. It's not ethical or legal for me to do. Yeah. That. And they all tell me the same thing. They can't afford help. And they're, they're, they have a seroma. They have wound breakdown. They have an infection and they don't know what to do. And if they were here in the United States, they would have a surgeon helping them. Right. And I tell people too, like sometimes the reason it's cheaper, not only is it not necessarily a top tier doctor, but you're not paying for aftercare. Like you're paying for that one visit. So it's easy for them to say they have no complications because they have no idea. They don't know. They're not yeah. taking care of you afterwards. And like you said, there's a lot of the, all these medical tourism like agencies like benefit from it. So they kind of roll out the carpet that, oh, you get your food included, you get all these things. But those things are nice, but those things aren't really the most important things for right. you to heal afterwards. Right. Staying in a nice hotel in Mexico for a few days is not aftercare you know the first couple days after surgery does not make aftercare aftercare is a many month thing where you have a surgeon making sure that your results are progressing as expected and it's also a health risk you have somebody flying who the next two days after surgery after having a big procedure um i had a comment recently where someone said just go to columbia um, it's so much cheaper and they'll do everything you need and, you know, a rep- and, and it's better care. So we obviously replied back to that and said, no, that's, that's not actually true. And she's like, oh no, you, American doctors just wanted you to come in for as many procedures as possible. So they won't do it all together. That comment clearly has no idea no, that the actually yeah. Columbia, if they're doing so many procedures, that they're not being safe. The reason you're getting your procedures broken up is people are being safe here. Right. Absolutely. I mean, any doctor with even a minimal amount of knowledge of surgery and anesthesia knows that as the operative time goes up, your surgical risk goes up. 
it doesn't matter what surgery you're having. And so we split surgeries up for a variety of reasons, but it's often just to minimize surgical risk. And especially some cosmetic surgeries can have significant blood loss, like extensive lipo and fat grafting. And so you also have to consider that as well. And, and you know, anyone, the problem with a lot of these places is if you wave a credit card around, someone will take it and do anything you want. I, I did a, <laughs> yeah. I actually did a podcast with a girlfriend, you may know her, Ashley Roby, another plastic mm-hmm. surgeon. And she sent me some stuff before we were talking about who we were talking about. And it was a medical tourism agency that one of her patients had told her about. And there was an add to cart button. So it's just, there's anything goes, they're just technicians. They're operating as technicians. They're not operating as an expert guiding you. You could go and go BBL, tummy tuck, breast dog. That's That's so crazy. Yeah, it was crazy. And that's, that's not how it's supposed to be. Surgeon's job is to help guide you to the safest, best decision plan that gets you to your goal. It's not to do anything you ask them to do. That's not safe. And no surgeon should ever do that. And you don't really know in who is doing your surgery. If exactly. we know things are regulated here, so that's near possible for something like to switch out, but you don't know that the person you met is actually the person who's operating on you when you go somewhere else, because unless, like you said, unless you speak the language or you grew up there, you're familiar with it. You don't really know what the legal system like there is there for um, if you do have issues and like who's regulating everything. Right. Like what, what legal recourse do you have if you have some kind of un- acceptable outcome or problem it's often none and I think too what ends up happening is people do go out they have complications and then the headlines end up becoming plastic surgery nightmare whatever and it's not taken into context that this person didn't actually go to a like a board certified plastic surgeon in America and Canada you know what I mean like it's it's all taken out and then it makes people even more scared I'm um, scared of plastic surgery look at all these horrible things that happen yeah absolutely so what do you think is kind of like as we become we are becoming a more global society right and people i think aren't going to stop traveling do you think do you think that there's going to sometimes become setups where people are having surgeries out there and then having clinics located in the u.s afterwards for aftercare do you think that might happen at some point i mean i wouldn't be surprised and in, in general i mean especially I, hopefully it will be done in ethical way but it probably won't I mean, what, yeah. will, what will likely end up happening is these medical tourism agencies will find, you know, some doctor that wants to make an extra buck that's probably not going to be a surgeon that yeah. will, you know, run satellite, you know, wound care or follow up clinics for people. I would not be surprised with that at all. Um, what are some trends this kind of that you're seeing um, that you think are kind of exciting trends that are like good things that are happening in plastic surgery? So I'm. You know, I struggle a little bit with plastic surgery as a woman and a mom of a girl in, in that I, I don't love sometimes the the image that we are kind of helping put out into the world. And what I mean by that is I, I think that I'm a big fan of beauty of all different sorts, all different cultures, all different sorts. I think women are beautiful from all over the world. And often the kind of Eurocentric, American-centric beauty standard is what we have been striving for, which I don't love. And I love that we have expanded our, our like beauty kind of world a bit in recent years. And we're starting to appreciate different types of beauty. You know, instead of saying that, you know, you have a rhinoplasty or an ethnic rhinoplasty, which is kind of weird yeah. in a lot of ways, you know, we're, we're spending more time going, what is somebody from this culture? What's meaningful to them? And what features do they want to enhance? And so instead mm-hmm. of removing their heritage or enhancing their heritage, and I, and I really think that's great. Um, the other thing is that in the last couple of years, we're finally moving away from some of the extremes. And I don't love the idea of telling women that you can't be beautiful or meet a beauty standard unless you do plastic surgery. And when you're creating body parts that are out of proportion with what actually exists in the world, um, you're creating something that women like basically can't be beautiful unless they have surgery. And I don't love that either. So I do like that we're, we're focusing more on subtle things where you can enhance something or or make something a bit smaller that may be a little bit too big or or the opposite but we're not trying to create a whole different like very pretty alien physique that that isn't obtainable for a normal person and i think that's a lot healthier i agree i think that we're hopefully the you know the current 
uh, I guess the current uh, culture environment has sh shifted a little bit where people are trying to celebrate everybody. Yes. And we're trying to say that, you know, I like the way you say it. It's just we're enhancing beauty. We're not creating it. Um, and so I, and I think that as we I think part of that is also going to be from an education standpoint that in residencies that we start focusing on that as much because I can tell you I, I learned in residency but I don't think much was really put on thinking about different ethnic groups and how we approach that because it wasn't being talked about as much but I think we have the opportunity now to start really educating on looking at people um, within their own cultures and ethnicities and not just focusing like you said on one Eurocentric ideal. Yeah I think I think it's nice I mean you know, like I said, I'm always going to struggle with it a little bit because I've been subject to those same beauty standards as have you. And it's, it can feel oppressive, especially when you're young and you're developing and growing and your brain is maturing to to see those things. And so I think it's nice that we're, we're finally taking a little bit of a of a turn into a more a more reasonable world where we're enhancing people. And, you know, hopefully the future will stop obsessing about the ideal everything because there's no ideal everything. There's just different ways to be beautiful. And the goal should always be helping the patient achieve that and not turning them into an ideal. Yeah. You know, it's funny, you know, I've tried to talk to my six-year-old about it because she's already starting to get interested in beauty things. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I told her, I said, when I wear makeup, I'm just trying to be fancy. Right. Um, I'm beautiful all the time. I'm just trying to be fancy. She's looked at me and she goes, now nah, you look better with the makeup on. <laughs> I was like, you're you're missing the point of this conversation, right? Yeah, and, and you know, for makeup, for me, like I, you know, I think my my daughter always will like she knows like I'm no, I like to match, I like to match my eye makeup to this, and so I think the focus is oh, it's just part of my outfit. I'm not trying to be prettier. It's just like if I choose a blue pair of socks to match my my sweatshirt, I also chose some blue eyeshadow and eyeliner. So I think you know it's it's hard, you know, as you know, it's hard as a parent because you you want your child to feel good about themselves and be comfortable and confident. And it's, it's really hard in today's society, especially with social media. Mm -hmm. it, it is, it's a challenge. And I think that by keeping putting out like good educational content and, and being diverse with it, it's not anymore just like, this is the only ideal you can have. Right. I think that we are finding that yet, like you said, there's beauty in all sorts of bodies and shapes. Um, you know, I think we have a lot of work to do with that from a social media standpoint, um, because there's always going to be some people who want to um, cash in on on insecurities. And uh, but I think that like as more and more younger creators are coming out through programs, because I mean, right now, like people are in medical school and residency and they have huge followings and they have these really interesting social media channels. And so I think that as uh, more and more of those, like I think enlightened and more worldly uh, uh, world, world focus, I guess um, people are coming out of training and they're bringing their voices out too. Uh, hopefully we will be able to change some of the conversations a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. And more women. I think, you know, yes. women are 94% right statistically of cosmetic surgery patients. And for decades, we have been told by men what we should look like. And it's been a very, I mean, come on, how many of your friends' social medias do you see men post befores and afters? And in the comments, people are like, now they're hot. You make yeah. her hot. You gave her <laughs> hot. You know, that's so offensive and disgusting. But that is often how things are seen from the male gaze. And I think that yeah. having the female gaze in our specialty and our input is going to just help everyone be better. And to be honest, I absolutely hate it when people call them their dolls. Like, like that, that tag, I hate that. Hashtag. I hate that when they and I know nice people who use it. Work. So I'm not saying, but I just, to me, I'm like, you're not a doll. Like it just, it, it bugs me. Like there's some like, <laughs> wizard that like graced them with their, their hot knife. You know, I, I, my knife made you hot. And it's, it's really so offensive. And I, I, I agree. I think that I, I hate it. I think that's so gross. So what do you see, what's the next 10 years look like for you? Like, what do you, how do you see your practice changing and growing? It's a good question. You know, I'm not, I'm not sure. I, I think I, I would love to continue my educational content in particular around implants and um, reconstruction and aesthetic surgery. I think that that has been an area that I think one of the biggest reasons that the BII community has kind of solidified and become a bit, you know, anti-medicine and not interested in any type of evidence-based information is because of us, because of what we did to them. 
And I think that my goal is to try to coax them back over so they can get better care. So I think that one of the problems is for decades, we were telling women implants don't have problems. They're permanent devices. There's no potential issues. You'll just look hot if you get them. They don't need to be monitored. You'll never have a surgery again. And that's not true. And Mm -hmm. women are smart. You know, we can navigate these decisions with information. And if we're given information, we can make decisions and and be fine. And that often means still choosing implants. You don't need to mislead us to make us have an implant. The problem is, is when you start a relationship with distrust, that is that is what the relationship now is. And so these patients don't trust us anymore. And that has allowed people who are profiting off of them to coax them in. And, and they have accepted these doctors with open arms and these doctors are harming them, um, to be frank. So I think that is really what I see myself continuing to spend time doing. I do a lot of implant removals in my practice, but just in general, I'm, I'm going to be working more with kind of patient education and continuing patient education. I'm actually going to be working with one of the implant companies, which seems counterintuitive to educate the public about implant safety because people deserve to know, they deserve to know what they're putting in their bodies and what the potential risks are. And they deserve to know accurate information about what Mm -hmm. risks are. And that's wonderful because if they're not getting accurate information from you, they're going to be getting misinformation from somebody else because they're, they want to learn. They want to know what's going on. They want to learn. And I think it's like anything, when you've had a complication or problem, you want to know why. And when you go search for it, there's a lot of wrong whys out there. There's a lot of wrong information that will breed distrust in the medical community and end up with the patient having procedures often they don't need and that are more dangerous because they've had bad information. So I just want to keep giving good information to people. It may not help me professionally so much, but it, it just, I think it helps women understand what they're getting more. Well, thank you so much for sharing all your thoughts. And if for our listeners, if you are not following Dr. Colleen, you absolutely should because she just like really puts out amazing content. Would you share your handle? Sure. Um, so on TikTok, I'm Kelly Colleen MD, and that's where most of the action is. Um, I also have an Instagram. It's K L Colleen K I L L E E N. And probably about 50, 60 percent of my content makes it over to Instagram, but TikTok's kind of where I'm at. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, This was awesome. And uh, look forward to maybe seeing you at ASPS if you're going to be there. I'll be there. I'll see you. All right. All right. Thank you so much for tuning into the Confidence Doc podcast and stay tuned for next week. As we wrap up another episode of the Confidence Doc, I want to extend our heartfelt thank you for being a part of our community. If today's conversation resonated with you, remember that Dr. Rettinam and her team are here to support you on your journey to self-confidence and beauty. Your story is unique and it's our privilege to help you create the masterpiece that is your life. If you'd like to book a consultation with Dr. Rettinam, you can visit her webpage at drrufminiretinam.com. Fill out a contact form and one of her coordinators will get with you accordingly.